Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all. It's 10 o'clock in Geneva, where I'm based in Switzerland. It's four o'clock in the afternoon in Vietnam. Uh, my name is Robert Boss, and I'm here to welcome you uh, to this webinar uh, on compliance with water supply and sanitation laws, insights, and best practices organized by IWA in collaboration um, with the Vietnamese Administration for Technical um, Infrastructure of the Ministry of Construction in Hanoi. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to this webinar, um, which will address the efforts of the government of Vietnam to formulate a law on drinking water supply and sewerage. Um, we have been working with the Vietnamese authorities to put some presentations together for this uh, webinar that will highlight experiences from other parts of the region. Um, and we also will hear from the Vietnamese authorities on the actual status of the preparation of this law and what the issues are that they would like to see discussed towards the end of the webinar. Uh, on the next slide, uh, just to give you a few introductions of um, the issues that are important to keep in mind when you're working on Zoom. Um, first of all, this webinar is available in both Vietnamese and English. Um, and so at the bar at the bottom of your screen, you will find um, uh, a sign that lets you choose the interpretation. Um, and, um, and that helps you to um, get the um, uh, right language. So there's English channel and there is the, what is called French, but that's really the Vietnamese language channel. Um, you can also uh, suppress the original channel by putting um, a sign on um, mute the original audio. Um, if you have any problem, then put something, a uh, question in the chat, and that is being monitored throughout the webinar to see whether we can help you with uh, specific issues related to this. Um, as for the um, as for the next uh, slide, please. As for the workings of the um, of the webinar. First of all, I should say that the webinar will be recorded and made available on demand afterwards. Um, and we hope that the speakers have looked after the securing of copyright permissions for any work they're presenting. Um, and uh, of course, any of the opinions uh, and um, conclusions and recommendations that are contained in the presentations are those of the speakers only and not necessarily reflect the policies of IWA. Um, as an organization. On the next slide, you will see next slide, you will see the um, webinar information. Um, and we ask you to please, if the webinar for some reason suddenly ends, uh, which can happen for technical reasons, that you uh, get out of it and reconnect. Um, and please use the chat box um, to um, and also the QA box. Uh, to uh, communicate with the organizers and submit any questions that you may have. On the next slide, um, you will get some further information on that. So you see that the chat box is there for general requests and interactive activities, and the Q&A box is there for specific questions. Um, so the next slide, um, shows you the agenda. You will have, you see, we'll have an opening and I will shortly hand over to Professor Viet An to give the introduction from the Vietnamese side. Um, then we will have three presentations from the international participants. Um, one is a video of one by Tom Mollenkopf, the president of IWA, and then two live ones uh, with case studies from the Philippines by Jose Lito Riego de Dios and from Australia by David Cundliffe. After that, we will go to the Vietnamese perspective, specifically to the draft water and uh, sewerage law by Mr. Duke. 
And followed, following on from that, there will be the interactive panel discussion, and I'll introduce you to the additional panelists also later on. Um, and that will fall, be ending with a conclusion and um, and um, some summary by me and by Professor Vietnam. So on the next slide, um, we'll see the uh, you see the moderators and speakers. So I'm the first moderator. The other moderator is my co-moderator is Professor Viet An Nguyen uh, in Vietnam. And I would now like to hand over to him first to give his introduction um, to the webinar. Professor Viet An. Thank you, Robert. Uh, xin uh, kính chào các uh, quý ông, quý bà, các uh, đồng nghiệp và các quý vị đại biểu. Thì, uh, Việt Nam hiện nay đang uh, diễn ra một quá trình uh, phát triển rất là nhanh, mạnh và gắn liền với nó là một cái nhu cầu ở cấp nước, thoát nước và xử lý nước thải và vệ sinh môi trường rất là thiết yếu. Với 100 triệu dân thì gần 20 triệu mét khối nước một ngày được sử dụng để cung cấp nước cho các đô thị, các vùng nông thôn, các cái hoạt động sản xuất, kinh doanh, dịch vụ. Và mặc dù đã có luật môi trường, luật tài nguyên nước, luật xây dựng, nhưng mà xung quanh những hoạt động khai thác, sản xuất, phân phối, cung cấp nước sạch thì vẫn còn nhiều việc phải làm. Chưa kể những cái luật trên còn nảy sinh những cái vấn đề trồng chéo bất cập. Và các yêu cầu ngày càng cao về chất lượng nước cũng như là chất lượng dịch vụ. For the quality of water, quality of services, on sustainable development, on green growth, on climate change adaptation, in the context in which the water resources is being depleted, the uh, energy crisis and other challenges. That's the reason why the National Assembly and the government of Vietnam have agreed to issue the law on water supply and drainage that will uh, be uh, completed in 2025. The focal point is uh, MOC, uh, the Department of Technical Infrastructure, together with uh, that, um, uh, our association, uh, the VWSA, is uh, also uh, an important uh, focal point. And uh, together with that, we also have the international organizations and experts accompanying us. And this uh, webinar, I have also uh, international uh, experts and colleagues who also pay attention to the topic because law development and institutional arrangement are highly necessary for the water sector to develop sustainably and efficiently. Uh, on Vietnam side, we are very honored to introduce the uh, president of uh, VWSA, Dr. Nguyễn Ngọc Diệp. Can you raise your hand? And uh, also, we have uh, Dr. Trần Anh Tuấn, Madam Hạ Thanh Hằng, and uh, uh, us, the uh, Deputy um, uh, President of the Association, as well as uh, partners of the VWSA uh, on the Department of uh, Technical Infrastructure with Mr. Tạ Quang Vinh, Director General, the focal point for developing water supply and water drainage law in the MOC. We are very thankful to the IWA uh, uh, to, uh, for your collaboration with VWSA uh, to uh, organize this webinar. Uh, thank you for inviting leading uh, famous uh, experts in the world and in the region to come to this webinar. We hope that this webinar will be highly useful for Vietnam and for the participants of the workshop to serve our work. And we also hope that we will continue to collaborate with the IWA and other international partners in developing laws and other technical activity. I'd like to wish the webinar a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Viet An, for these words of welcome. And so I would also like to welcome everybody. And I'm very happy to see there's such a huge contingent of Vietnamese participants uh, online. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the International Water Association. As you know, IWA is a, a global um, association of water professionals and practitioners um, and um, very active in very many different fields related to water and sanitation um, through its specialist groups, through its various um, uh, activities uh, at the country levels. Um, but of course, also through its um, its biennial 
World Water Congress and uh, and exhibition. The next one will be in 2024 in uh, in Toronto. And the World Water uh, World, the Water and Development Congress. The next one will be in December of this year in Kigali, Rwanda. And so IWA is very interested in supporting uh, the Vietnamese authorities in the formulation of this law. Um, and we understand that for this particular webinar, the key aspects of focus will be setting standards and norms, um, looking at regulatory frameworks, and also the mechanisms to ensure compliance with those standards and norms. Um, and that is really something where our president, uh, Tom Mollenkopf, has a lot to say about because Tom um, is basically by training uh, someone with a, a law background, with a legal background, and he has from Melbourne Business School an MBA. Um, he's now president of IWA since April 2021. Um, and he's also in Australia, senior advisor on water sector strategy, on senior a senior associate um, with the Aether Consultancy, and he's a member of the Australian Water Partnership um, Expert Review Panel. Um, and so, unfortunately, Tom is traveling right now and cannot be with us live, but he has submitted his video to introduce the issues from his perspective um, to you all. And so I ask Isabella now to please um, turn on the, the video. Hello. It's wonderful to be with you for this joint International Water Association, Vietnam Water Supply and Sewage Association webinar. What I wanted to talk to you about in the short time I have available is providing a context for water and sanitation law in Vietnam with some international perspectives. I'd like to start with the opening proposition that the legislative process is difficult at the best of times, but no more so than when it deals with water. The 19th century German philosopher Otto von Bismarck said that laws are like sausages it is better not to see them being made. The other propositions that I'd like to put forward are that nevertheless, water reform and water legislation is vitally important, but significantly it is achievable. By way of overview, I'll provide a context for water law legislation and reform. I'll talk a little bit about designing effective water laws. And then if time permits, I'll talk go through a couple of case studies and a conclusion. I think that the issues confronting Vietnam are well known uh, in a global context. We see water scarcity, we see pollution, and we see the impacts of climate change and other emerging risks around chemicals, uh, etc. Vietnam's water challenges, well, you know them probably better than me, but historically, Vietnam has been blessed with abundant water resources a productive agricultural system rooted in the fertile, uh, fertile floodplains, delta and hill slopes of the region. Currently, however, Vietnam, like much of Asia, is experiencing population growth, rapid industrialization, urbanization, and sadly, suboptimal water infrastructure development, together with that global phenomena of gl climate change. All of this is leading to increasing water scarcity and specifically to competition for water. I said at the outset that water reform is hard. Why is that? Well, the first thing is that water is a, a fluid and fugitive resource. And, and by this, I mean that it's in constant movement in accordance with the hydraulic cycle. It's renewable but it's unpredictable because its renewal depends on natural phenomena, particularly rainfall, which as we know is becoming increasingly unpredictable. Water reform deals with a highly emotional issue. Water resonates with us in cultural, economic and social senses, but in literature and art. We have strong, often competing interests and within government, there is often comp competition for time and money around the regulation of water. It's a valuable resource, but often we don't value it or price it economically. I also said that 
water reform is essential, essential. And that's because, as we all know, water is a fundamental enabler of health, economic well-being and social amenity. Sound water management practices impact not only on SDG 6, they impact on over half the SDG targets, either directly or indirectly. Given the changing circumstances, business as usual is no longer possible. Maintaining the status quo is not an option. We need better legislation. So, we need new laws. Will that fix the problem? Well, partly. New laws on water and sanitation are an important part of the solution, but not the entire solution. Legislation is part of a broader framework, or at least it ought to be. That broader framework should comprise a consideration of the governance architecture or the institutional structures surrounding water resource management. Government, regulators and the service delivery agencies, utilities, catchment managers, etc. We also need to consider the capabilities and the capacity of our people. We have to look at whether there's going to be adequate funding for the things that are necessary around sound water resource management. And we need to bring our communities with us and understand their needs better. Finally, I think there has to be common understanding between water utilities and society and regulators and society around the expectations and objectives of the law and then support that with a culture where we actually comply with laws rather than just have them sitting on a shelf. I'd also like to suggest that we are talking about not one water law, but probably many water laws. This is necessary if we're going to respond to the multiple dimensions of water. They comprise, for example, drinking water supply, stormwater and urban drainage, sewage management, flood, flood mitigation, and provision of water for irrigation services. This involves many different users and stakeholders, including on a regulatory front, where we very often deal with different agencies looking after farming, different agencies looking after flood mitigation, and different agencies looking after urban water supply and sewerage. We've got to consider not just consumptive uses, like cities, industry, and agriculture, but also transportation on our waterways and cultural, social and recreational, as well as environmental needs of our water. There will be different purposes and objectives for legislation as well, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But finally, our legislation needs to link between those different laws to ensure that they are complementary and mutually supportive and that they don't conflict with each other. There's also a chance to acknowledge the need for circularity. Water, that hydrological cycle, involves clean water, used water, the potential for recycling and reuse, not just seeing wastewater as a problem to be dealt with. Legislation also needs to be fit for purpose, by which I mean it must be effective in achieving the job that it was designed to do. Laws must be suitable for and respond to local needs. We can learn from international experiences, but I suggest we do not want to critically, uncritically rather, adopt laws from elsewhere. We need to consider the differences between example countries and Vietnam or the country where we want to apply the law and think about the nature of the legal system, how they might differ the respective legislative objectives between the two countries and the issues of language and culture, practices and institutional frameworks. Laws should consider also whether there's going to be a need to look after private sector participation or whether it's going to be substantially around government sector delivery. Private sector participation can comprise joint ventures, concessions, private-public partnerships such as design, build, own, operate and transfer or build, own, operate or build, operate and transfer or it could be alliances. The question is, 
if there is going to be substantial private sector participation, you'll probably need different laws or perhaps contractual arrangements to deal with that than you would do if it was a service being provided substantially by a government agency. What then might a good suite of laws cover? Well, I think first it's important to ensure that any legislation is simple and clear. Cover the essential elements, leave no gaps, provide a framework or an architecture within which society and industry can operate. The detailed laws I would envisage are going to include water quality and security of supply, the fundamental delivery of human needs uh, and human health, but also environmental protection and, and environmental discharges source protection and catchment uh, management and allocation of the resources would uh, need to be covered. And I'd suggest that economic and pricing issues need to be covered by a, a, a good suite of water laws. Finally, they will cover service delivery and service standards, risk management, possibly disaster response, and planning for the future. In the short time remaining, what I'd like to do is just talk about a few legislative drivers and challenges and the legislative approaches that have been taken in response to them in, in Australia. The first is that uh, in response to increasing water scarcity uh, in, uh, in Australia, particularly in at the agricultural sector, the nation adopted a water initiative back in 2004 that looked at a number of critical things around better utilisation and more rational utilisation of water. This started by setting a cap on the amount of water that can actually be taken from the environment out of, uh, out of river systems uh, and from groundwater. This is to ensure that water is abstracted at a sustainable level and that we don't exceed the, uh, the, the available water. The second thing is that there were clear rights given to water users about their entitlements to, uh, to water. There was, however, a requirement that in a year in which there is less water available due to uh, uh, the regular fluctuations uh, through drought, etc., that the allocated water amount could be varied amongst users. Of note, there was also a specific reservation that water must be kept available at all times for the environment. So we can't use 100% of the water that is available in our systems for consumptive uses without leaving anything to maintain a healthy environment. There are opportunities for individuals to trade water. So irrigators, farmers who have water entitlements can, if they don't need them, or if they can make more money by selling those entitlements, they may trade them to another water user. And finally, there is a comprehensive framework for monitoring water abstractions and for a, an accounting system uh, around water that is utilised in, uh, 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 in our society. Within the urban sector, there have also been uh, challenges again particularly around meeting the demands of population growth with a lim limited uh, uh, availability of water from, uh, from rainfall, from surface water. The consequence of that has been that most urban utilities in Australia have adopted a portfolio response. And by this, I mean that they are now looking at multiple sources of water to meet our urban needs, consumption uh, and industry. So. There is an increasing reliance on water recycling, on desalination, and where available, on the use of groundwater resources. Uh, in addition, there's been better management of our catchments, and there has been a smarter use of water with more efficient uh, utilisation of water through a number of uh, conservation schemes. All of these have required support from legislation and in some cases limitations around the way water that uh, can be used to ensure that it is done efficiently and fairly. My final observation is that uh, there has also been 
a gradual transition over recent, recent years from large scale infrastructure and institutions to more flexible and distributed infrastructure that is a more integrated approach. This too means that we're no longer necessarily just regulating large water utilities or water suppliers, but we need to have legislation that can deal with smaller on-site and devolved systems. I'd like to conclude by saying that I said at the outset that water reform, water legislation is difficult but it is achievable. And I think Vietnam is very well placed for water legislation reform process through anticipating the needs and opportunities uh, in this space, through having a commitment at governmental and industry levels, and through having a strong governance framework and capabilities upon which to build. There are some great opportunities and I hope very much that you'll be able to seize them. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, that was uh, Tom Mollenkopf's contribution, which I thought was uh, very rich and comprehensive. Um, unfortunately, he's not there to answer any immediate questions you may have um, because he's traveling, as, as you've noticed. But the, um, the presentation gave a broad perspective. It focused on the uh, sustainable development goals, um, which are uh, which show that water is key and that better legislation is really needed to, uh, to achieve those goals. And I would like to also point to the fact that to monitor those goals, we have some very specific, um, well-defined indicators that could also um, be usefully considered in the formulation of new legislation on water in Vietnam. Um, of course, uh, he also placed the water law in the broader context, and Professor Viet An already did that at the opening when he uh, indicated that, of course, there are other uh, water-related laws, including laws that deal with the broader water resources issues. Um, and it's clear that any new water law on drinking water and sewage will have to be harmonized with those existing laws. And actually, the process of developing a new water and, and sewage law should also be an opportunity to see whether the other laws need any updating. He talked about water fit for purpose and also about laws fit for purpose, so learning lessons from other parts of, from other countries and particularly countries in the region where Vietnam is, um, but making sure that what is developed for Vietnam is fit for uh, the purpose that is there in Vietnam. And he talked about the circularity and the need to look at uh, all aspects of the water cycle, including considering wastewater as a resource rather than as waste. And he pointed to the essential elements um, of any water and sanitation law. So I think that's a lot of food for thought already, but I would like to now introduce the next speaker, and that is Mr. Joselito Riego de Dios, who is um, a public health engineer. He is the head of the, the chief of the healthy environment and sanitation division in the Department of Health in the Philippines, and he has many years of experience in the field of um, of regulation of water quality. Um, and um, he is a long-standing member of the WHO-based regulators network, um, where he has been contributing both on issues related to the regulation of drinking water and also of sanitation. So, uh, Joselito, the floor is yours. We're all listening to your experience in the Philippines. So, again, I'm Engineer Joselito Regadillos from the Department of the Philippines. It is my privilege to be part of this webinar to share with you our experiences in relation to water and sanitation laws. Thanks to the organizers, you know, International Water Works Association and uh, uh, Vietnam Ministry of Construction. Next slide, please. So the, in the Philippines, water and sanitation are governed by three major national laws. First is the Presidential Decree 1067, otherwise known as the Water Code of the Philippines. It's a law that governs the ownership, appropriation, utilization, exploration, development, conservation, and protection of water resources. 
So in terms of areas of regulation, so this is Presidential Decree 1067, uh, it focuses on the resource and economic regulation. The agency responsible for this is the National Water Resources Board. Uh, the, another law is the Presidential Decree 856 or the Code on Sanitation of the Philippines. It's a law that directs all public services towards the protection and promotion of health. It prescribes a part of the code on sanitation. It prescribes standards and procedures to ensure the safe quality of drinking water as well as sanitation. Then another, uh, uh, in terms of areas of regulation of so the code on sanitation, it focuses on drinking water quality regulation and sanitation regulation. Uh, as to the responsible agency, uh, the agency responsible to implement or enforce this law is uh, primarily in the Department of Health, where I belong, and of course the local government units. So because of local government units, uh, we have about 1,800 local government units that um, uh, implement or enforce the provisions of this law. And the last major law is the Republic Act 1378, which is the planning code. It's a law that defines the practice and regulations of planning. So the areas of regulation of uh, planning code is the design and construction of water and sanitation planning system. The agencies responsible uh, for this law is the Department of Public Works and Highways and the local government unit. So these are the three major laws that we have. But on the succeeding slides, I will be discussing more on the provisions of the Presidential Decree 856 or the code and sanitation, in as much as it is the main law or major law that uh, governs you know, the, the regulations of the water and sanitation. Okay, next slide. Okay, the, the code and sanitation of the Philippines was enacted in 1975. So under the law, uh, uh, it says, 21 chapters, and one of the chapters is uh, uh, about water supply or drinking water supply in, in, in particular, that's in chapter two. So under chapter two of the code, it says that the, the drinking water quality shall conform to the criteria set by the national drinking water standard. Then the treatment of water shall be in accordance with the prescribed procedures of the Department of Health. Then the initial, initial and periodic examination of drinking water sources shall be required to, to all. And then the examination of drinking water shall be performed only in laboratories duly accredited by the department. So those are the general provisions of the law under, uh, under its chapter two, water supply. To operationalize the provisions of this chapter, uh, the Department of Health issued the, uh, an implementing rules and regulations as well as additive order to operation, as I said, to operationalize the provisions, the general provisions of the code and sanitation. So the implementing rules and regulations covers uh, requirements in relation to source development. This requires a sort of uh, site clearance of the proposed location of a certain source prior to its construction, and then the requirement for initial and operational permit from the Department of Health, again, prior to its construction and after its construction, uh, uh, respectively. And then another requirement, no, to, uh, it's a certificate of portability from the local health office to be secured by the operators of the water supply system uh, to ensure that the quality be, uh, the quality of the water from the newly constructed water supply system is compliant with the Philippine national standards for drinking water. And then part, another requirement under this implementing rules and regulations is a, requ is a requirement for sanitary permits for all water vendors. So water vendors are also regulated by the local government units and uh, as part of the requirements before they will be able to, to sell their, their, their product for drinking water, they are required to secure a sanitary permit from the local health office. So in, to support this implementing rules and regulations, a number of administrative orders were also issued also by the Department of Health uh, 
uh, as I said, to support the implementing rules and regulations. Like Administrative Order Number 2006-0024, is a rules and regulations governing the accreditation of laboratories for drinking water analysis. As mentioned earlier, uh, water examination of drinking water is only be conducted or performed in, in, in laboratories duly accredited by the Department of Health. So the details of accreditation contained in this Administrative Order Number 2006 just 0024. It is the Department of Health, you know, the central office who, 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 who does the accreditation of the testing laboratory. Then another administrative order is AO 2017 just 0010 entitled the Philippine National Standard for Drinking Water. So the Philippine National Standard for Drinking Water provides the standard parameters and values for drinking water quality as well as the standard procedures for treatment as well as uh, standards for analysis and uh, interpretations of results of analysis. So this uh, the, this uh, administrative order is the the main you know, the main uh, the main uh, regulation to ensure that all drinking water providers are compliant with the with, with the uh, in terms of drinking water quality. Then another administrative order is in relation to the water safety plan. To ensure no, that the drinking water quality is compliant with the standard, the Department of Health issued this administrative order 2014-3027, which is the national policy on water on water safety plan for all drinking water service providers. So this administrative order requires no, uh, the mandatory compliance of all drinking water service providers uh, uh, to develop and implement their water safety plan. And this water safety plan uh, shall be subject for review and approval by the Department of Health based on Administrative Order Number 2017-006, which is the guidelines for the review and approval of the water safety plans for drinking water service providers. So basically, these are our rules and regulations uh, in, re in relation to drinking water quality. So as I said, the major uh, agency responsible to implement these laws is the Department of Health and the local government units. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, under the law, under the implementing rules and regulations, it's also it's also prescribed no uh, a uh, the third all government units all local government units establish a local drinking water quality monitoring surveillance program through the creation of local drinking water quality monitoring committee. So the committee shall oversee the operations of the water supply system and the quality of the water being produced by this water supply system. The members of the committee are the following. It's being led by the local health authority or the local chief executive with members from the local health office together with the different offices uh, with, uh, under the local government unit, like the, the uh, municipal or city engineer's office, the environment and natural resources office. Um, and of course, other members of the committee include the the municipal or city councillors, uh, members coming from the water service providers, either, uh, either public or private water service providers, and representatives from the uh, the Department of Health, as well as representatives from non-government organizations and the provincial health office. So these are the members of the local drinking water quality monitoring committee who's in charge of implementing the water quality surveillance program at the local level. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So the surveillance program of the local government unit designed according to the improved uh, framework set by the, the World Health Organization. I think, uh, I believe you are familiar with this framework, no? This is the improved framework for drinking water safety, which, which was introduced by the World Health Organization in the fourth uh, edition of WHO uh, guidelines on drinking water quality. So the framework has three uh, components. 
setting the health-based targets, no? uh, the health-based targets would be based on the health outcomes or, or in uh, based on water quality, performance targets, or specified technology targets. So based on these targets, no? the, 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 the second component uh, is the availability of a water service provider that implements water safety plans to achieve the health-based target set by the Department of Health. So to monitor uh, if these water safety plans are really being implemented to achieve the health-based targets, the next component is the, availability, the presence of an independent surveillance, which is normally being uh, implemented by the local government unit through the local health office. So that's how the local how the local government unit frames their local uh, surveillance program. So next slide. Okay. Next slide, please. In terms of sanitation regulations, again, again, uh, based on the code on sanitation or presidential decree eight five six, chapter seventeen of the code is uh, under sewage collection disposal, excreta and disposal. It provides that the approval of the Secretary of Health or his duly authorized representative is required on the following on the following matters. First, the construction of any approved type of toilet for every house, including community toilets, which may be allowed for a group or small houses and light materials or temporary in nature. Second, plants of individual sea waste disposal system and the subsurface absorption system or other treatment device. Third, location of any toilet or sea waste disposal system in relation to a source of water supply. And then fourth, manufacture of septic tanks, methods of disposal of sludge from septic tanks or other treatment plants, as well as the plant's design data and specifications of a new or existing sea waste system or sea waste treatment plant and the discharge of untreatment effluents of septic tanks and or sea waste treatment plants to bodies of water. So all of this uh, subject for approval of the Secretary of Health or his duly authorized representative. To implement the, or to operationalize these provisions of the law, of the code, uh, again, the Department of Health issued an implementing rules and regulations which provide no, the detailed procedures and processes uh, to, to, as I said, to, to operationalize the, the general provisions of Chapter 17 of the Code and Sanitation. So under this implementing rules and regulations, it provides those standards as well as uh, requirements you know, in relation to on-site sanitation, approved on-site sanitation, such as septic tank system, uh, sanitary previs, and other uh, emerging sanitation technology, uh, on-site sanitation technology. Similarly, there are standard requirements uh, uh, for off-site sanitation, like sewage uh, management, as well as septage or fecal sludge management. So for this, under this implementing rules and regulation, there are uh, permits or clearances that are required you know, to be secured by the operators prior to their construction. So among these permits and clear, uh, among these permits include the following. Uh, they are required to secure an environmental clearance uh, uh, from the Department of Health you know, to ensure that uh, the operators, uh, the, the design of the treatment facilities are in accordance with the uh, rules and regulations of the Department of Health. And then prior to the operations of these uh, facilities, they are required to secure an operational permit again from the Department of Health. Similarly, uh, uh, prior to their operations, no, uh, they are also required to secure sanitary permits from the local health office. Then another type of permit is the sanitation technology verification clearance, which is applicable for those newly or emerging type of technology that will be uh, mark, uh, that will be uh, made available to uh, to public. Uh, uh, that will be made available to public. Okay. So then to, so again to support this implementing rules and regulations, the Department of Health also issued. An admissive order number 2019 0047, dated October 29, 2019, 
which is the national standard on the design, construction, operations, and maintenance of the septic tank system, in as much as um, the most common type of treatment uh, sewage treatment system in the Philippines is septic tank. So, so that's the main reason why we have to issue this Assistive Order Number 2019-0047. So basically, these are the rules and regulations of the Department of Health uh, in relation to sanitation regulation. So next slide. Okay. Oh, so you know, Lastly, can, you, can you speed up a little bit, please? Okay, yes. So our laws are not perfect. So we have uh, we have a lot of issues or challenges no, in relation with implementation or enforcement, and some of which are the following. So uh, our law is outdated in its mass as created or formulated in 1975, and uh, being 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 old, no, it's, uh, some of the provisions are incoherent with other provisions of new laws that we have. And, uh, and one, one, one issue is that it has low penalty provisions. Then another issue, uh, there's an overlap of functions from more government officers you know, in relation also to the different provisions of other laws. There's a rapid turnover of sanitation personnel of the local government units is responsible to enforce the provisions of the law. There's a lack of an adequate number of qualified or trained sanitation personnel at the local level. And, and with that, uh, there's a poor understanding on the existing law. Another issue is the no standard educational requirement for the hiring of sanitation inspection positions. Then, of course, uh, under the law, there is no police power given to the sanitation inspector, which you know, uh, hinder the implementation of the law. And then, then the another issue is that uh, there's an adequate access to water laboratory facilities uh, to, to monitor the, the water quality at the local level. And lastly, one, uh, the, uh, the last issue is that the lack of appropriate sanitation technologies for different located areas, differently um, uh, located uh, areas. So I think that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Back to you, Robert. Thank you very much, Joselito, for a very interesting overview of um, the framework in the legal framework in the Philippines, which obviously is very solid and very comprehensive. Um, you pointed out to some of the key issues that make up the uh, code of sanitation when it comes to, uh, to drinking water, including accreditation of laboratories, national standard setting, the application of water safety planning throughout and also the guidelines for auditing water safety plans. Um, and in the area of sanitation, you pointed very rightly to the need to cover both off-site and on-site uh, sanitation. Um, and of course, in your, uh, in your final slide, you pointed to the need for regular updating of the law. Uh, it's very nice to have a law, but it's even better if it can be regularly updated to meet new needs and requirements. Um, the, the need for clear roles and responsibilities, not only within the law, but also um, in the context of broader, sorry for the clock, but we're in Switzerland, so there are many clocks here. Um, clear roles and responsibilities, and also the turnover and shortage of, of staff to actually man uh, all the needs uh, that, that have to be complied with uh, under the law. Um, so we'll come back to some of these issues in the discussion, no doubt. I would now like to move on to David Cundiff in South Australia. Um, David, uh, please give us uh, your reflections on um, the experience you have with regulation uh, in your part of the world. Thank you, Robert. Uh, and my presentation will dovetail um, really very well into the presentation that Tom gave earlier. So Tom spoke about water resource uh, legislation in Australia. Um, I'm going to speak um, quite specifically about drinking water regulations and sanitation. So just to set the scene, um, this is Australia. Um, we have five major cities and three smaller cities. And about 70% of our population lives on the coast in those colored sections uh, on the map. The interior parts of Australia, um, a large 
percentage um, is desert. Uh, the population density, less than one person uh, per 10 square kilometers. Um, so that represents a great challenge to us. 93% of the population uses mains water. A slightly higher percentage than that actually receive mains water. Some people choose to drink uh, water supplied from rainwater tanks. There's a history of use of rainwater tanks in Australia, particularly in our rural areas, where over 75% of houses have a rainwater tank. And in total, 10% of uh, drinking water supply in Australia comes from rain rainwater tanks. 88% of the population is connected to public wastewater systems. And the others are served by uh, on-site systems. An important uh, aspect of regulation in Australia is that regulation is a state and territory issue. Uh, we wouldn't have a federated uh, country um, if the states weren't given responsibility for uh, certain activities and water and sanitation included in those activities. Regulation, though, is supported by a range of national guidelines. So, for example, the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines. And we have national policies and standards. And we've already heard um, discussion in the Philippines about uh, plumbing codes. We have the same, the National Construction uh, and Plumbing Codes. Uh, and these are embedded in legislation. All of these national documents are developed in consultation with the states and territories at a very high level, at a very minist at a ministerial level. So that ensures that all the states um, support and use uh, those national documents. So we have a very consistent um, application of, for example, the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines, which we use to define the safety of drinking water, and which we reference in our uh, drinking water legislation. We have further support from national organisations and bodies, uh, such as the Water Quality Expert Reference Panel, which includes representatives from all states and territory public health agencies. And we're fortunate we, we have uh, a limited number um, of states and territories. So um, we get along pretty well uh, and we, uh, we work well together. So this is just an example of some, some of the documents that we use. So on the far left-hand side of the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines, it says 2011, um, but in the fine print, uh, you might be able to read that it was last updated in September 2022. The National Plumbing Code of Australia. Uh, we have Australian standards. Uh, so we have an Australian standard. And the one I've shown is for on-site domestic wastewater uh, treatment units, and in particular, secondary treatment systems. Then states have their own codes uh, and guidelines uh, to support implementation of legislation. So I'm, uh, on the right-hand side, I've got two codes from my own state of South Australia, uh, an on-site wastewater systems code and a community uh, wastewater management systems code. And I'll get back to uh, sanitation uh, in a few minutes. If I could have the next slide, please. So drinking water regulations, they're relatively new in Australia. So they're newer than the Philippines uh, legislation. The first uh, regulations were introduced in, in 2003 in Victoria. And they were introduced, in fact, all of this legislation was introduced during the millennium drought. And the reason for introducing the legislation was to provide guidance on the requirements uh, for producing safe drinking water and also to provide direction on how safety will be measured and how it will be measured by the regulators. Importantly, our, our regulations provide a, a level playing field for all types of drinking water providers. And Tom referred to whether you have legislation for government agencies or private uh, individuals, private operators. Our legislation applies to everybody. Most of our big drinking water providers are government owned but a lot of the smaller ones um, uh, can be private. So South Australia, my state, Victoria, New South Wales, and Queensland have legislation uh, 
that applies to drinking water safety. Other jurisdictions have policies and agreements between health agencies and drinking water suppliers on what's required. In most cases, the health depart department is the lead regulator. The scope of the legislation can vary a little. So in South Australia and New South Wales, we regulate all public water supplies. And a public water supply is one that involves two buildings. So we don't regulate private homes that have got an individual supply, uh, but all uh, public supplies uh, are regulated. And that includes urban centres, community water supplies, indigenous communities, water carters, schools, uh, tourist facilities, health facilities. We have a number of hospitals that provide rainwater for their uh, patients, particularly in country areas, because country folk like drinking rainwater. And uh, for food producers. So our drinking water regulations are designed specifically to be consistent with our food uh, legislation because production of safe food requires safe drinking water. So the common features of regulations, policies and agreements, recognition of the Australian drinking water guidelines. We refer back to that key national document. Requirement for risk management plans, which are embedded in the guidelines. So they're the Australian version of water safety plans. Auditing and inspecting of supplies, testing and reporting. So we require drinking water uh, providers to monitor um, and in our case to submit their monitoring plans and we require that they report their results to us. And when asked, they report to the communities as well. And we include instant notification procedures. So notification if something goes wrong. And that's the duty of the provider to notify the, uh, the regulator, the health department. One key feature of our regulations, of our legislation, is that they do not take a standard-based approach. They do not include a list of standards. What we do, as I've mentioned a moment ago, is we refer back to the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines, which have all the guideline values in them. So rather than producing a, uh, a list of rigid uh, standards, we refer back to the guidelines. Now that works for us. We've got a very limited number uh, of jurisdictions, you know, seven or eight. Um, and it gives us flexibility. It won't work everywhere, but for us it does. So that was drinking water. And drinking water is reasonably, I think it's reasonably straightforward. Um, our legislation is fairly consistent and, as I said, typically led by health departments. Sanitation is a little bit more complicated. Firstly, there is a general requirement that all development incorporating residential and community use requires installation and operation of appropriate sanitation facilities. And sanitation uh, can take three basic forms. Firstly, the large wastewater treatment plants that you see in large urban centres and capital cities. In Australia, they're typically operated by government-owned water utilities or local governments in larger urban centres. And the wastewater treatment plants treat sewage delivered by uh, typical sewage systems. Then there are community wastewater treatment plants um, typically operated by local government they're a little smaller, again, uh, include some type of sewerage system. And then finally, on-site wastewater systems operated by businesses, tourist facilities, and householders. So wastewater regulation. The administration of regulations does vary between jurisdictions, between the states and territories. It can include health departments with the assistance of local government, or it can, it can be led by environment protection agencies or housing departments in one case, a housing and construction department. Detailed attention in our case is applied to uh, on-site systems in all jurisdictions. We have quite specific processes for approval of treatment devices. Uh, so uh, septic tanks or aerobic wastewater treatment systems. 
And those approvals are issued to manufacturers. So they submit uh, their, the design of their system um, and they can get approval on a state basis. And if they're approved, then they're allowed to be installed. And we have processes for installation of treatment systems that are issued to landholders. And as I mentioned before, we have Australian standards that describe uh, you know, treatment requirements. Most jurisdictions also have juris codes of practice of the type that I showed earlier. Our larger treatment plants are typically licensed by EPAs with controls applied to effluent discharges. So this brings in both the health and the environmental aspects uh, of controlling uh, wastewater treatment. Health departments can also apply discharge limits and require reporting of, of non-compliance. Tom earlier mentioned that we're seeing increased use of wastewater recycling. Uh, so we're seeing increased beneficial use of treated wastewater. And again, that's subject to compliance with another set of Australian guidelines, the Australian Guidelines for Water Recycling. And recycled water schemes also require regulatory approval. So in summary, Regulation of drinking water quality in Australia uh, and regulation of sanitation is achieved by a combination of state and territory-based legislation and codes of practice. We have national guidelines and standards that support consistency. Regulation of drinking water is relatively recent with the first legislation developed 20 years ago. Uh, wastewater and sanitation legislation is older than that. So in the 80s, 90s, um, and we have a broad range of that legislation, which ranges from a prescriptive approach for on-site systems to licensing systems for our larger wastewater treatment plants. And with wastewater, we have a stronger involvement of environment protection agencies uh, than we do with drinking water. Our challenges, our principal challenges, uh, remain particularly in remote areas, but progress is being made. It takes several days to get to the centre of Australia if you're driving from Adelaide. Um, so that presents uh, difficulties and challenges for us. Um, but uh, we're working to uh, meet those challenges and to improve um, drinking water across Australia. And lastly, last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, David, for this uh, very interesting overview of how things work. Uh, legally and policy-wise and regulatory uh, in, uh, in Australia, in, in your state. And I think that the issue that you have for consistency, you know, you're, you set your policy and le legal frameworks um, at the uh, federal level, um, but then you have the operational part at the state level is very much relevant to the Vietnamese situation also, because I know that in Vietnam with 63, provinces and, and cities under the government, um, there's also a great deal of decentralization of operational issues. Now, I think I would like to hand over to uh, Professor Viet An to introduce the, the next speaker. Thank you, the three speakers, and thank you, Robert. Now we come to the Vietnam presentation. Uh, the representative of uh, the uh, Technical Infrastructure Department, Mr. Nguyễn Minh Đức, uh, from the Administration of Technical uh, Infrastructure of the MOC, uh, will share the Vietnam perspective on water and sanitation law. Hello, everybody. My name is Nguyễn Minh Đức from the uh, ATI of the MOC. I'd like to talk about Vietnamese perspective on water and sanitation law. Uh, and at the moment, the government assigned us to um, uh, develop uh, the law uh, from 2023 to 2025 for the law to be issued in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is rather uh, slow in uh, legislation development in comparison with uh, other countries in Vietnam. Uh, the water and sanitation law uh, is also slower than other laws in Vietnam. So the task is uh, very urgent. There are um, three parts in my presentation. Next slide. First uh, is a summary of the in law enforcement in, in terms of water supply and uh, sewage field. 
objective viewpoint requirement and then policies. Uh, uh, next slide. We have now 20, 250 enterprises operating 750 facility with the capacity of 11 million cubic meter day and night. For uh, water sewage and wastewater treatment, we have around 82 facilities for wastewater treatment. 10% of wastewater. At the moment, for Vietnam, for water supply and sewage, there are two decrease on water supply and one decree on wastewater treatment and water sewage. There are different laws like the law on water uh, uh, resources, the law on environmental protection and the uh, law on construction and the planning law. For water supply and sewage, we uh, haven't got the uh, content related to operation management, uh, service quality management. Our future law win based on the uh, gaps in these laws. And uh, there are also the requirements for uh, management. Um, if we see any gap in other law, we will fill this gap in uh, this new law. Uh, we uh, uh, want to propose five policy. Next slide, please. The first one is a synchronous management of uh, water supply and uh, sewage drainage. So for this policy group number one, we have uh, some uh, requirements uh, or regulation in the law on basic investigation, orientation, planning, uh, database. Uh, and the second point is about planning. Planning of water supply and sewage system is integrated in the provincial master plan. The master plans uh, we already have, but the content on water supply and uh, sewage is uh, very uh, uh, um, uh, is uh, very vague. And uh, over the past time, in terms of planning, in terms of mobilizing the uh, private people to uh, participate in investment, we uh, have a lot of. Uh, 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 we win also have to invest in the larger scale uh, system. Next, uh, in relation to investment in water supply and sewage system, we have investment law, uh, law on enterprises, and uh, we would like to refer to the support of uh, investment related to the investment in the um, decentralized uh, system uh, or the uh, wastewater uh, treatment uh, facilities uh, on site. The second policy is about management and operation of water supply and sewage works. So it is related to the selection of investment owners in terms of water supply and water drainage. At the moment, we also have uh, difficulties in uh, developing large scale facilities to supply water uh, in city and uh, rural area. We need to have uh, the principle in the law for that. And second, for the management operation of the facilities. It is uh, related to application of IT uh, and also the recycling of rainwater, wastewater and flood control uh, regulation. So the, that is for policy group two. Next slide. Policy group number three, related to management of water supply and sewage services. Uh, it is related to the quality of service. The quality of service need to be related to the safe uh, water supply and water drainage. And uh, also we have the regulation of, regu of uh, relationship uh, among the local government enterprises and people to harmonize benefits. And at the same time, uh, these regulations are related to some conditional uh, business condition, uh, uh, businesses uh, managing the output quality. 
the Ministry of Health manage the water quality, Ministry of Environment manages the water discharge uh, quality. The fourth uh, policy group, uh, next slide, policy group number four on finance in water supply and sewage for a rural uh, far flung area, there needs to be support of the state and there needs to be the investment uh, by the state so that we can develop the facilities to increase the uh, wastewater treatment uh, from 15% to 75% according to our direction. There are policies related to create the uh, what a large scale water supply facilities and we need to have a common water tariff uh, apply in both city and rural area the state budget is now investing in the water supply and water drainage facilities and uh, the we still have a limited budget for water drainage uh, so we need to enhance the responsibility of the people. They have to cover the uh, wastewater treatment cost. So uh, they need to be pushed up so that we can mobilize the, uh, uh, in this area. Next slide. The next one is related to uh, state management. There is a decentralization to different uh, agency enhancing the uh, power of the local government uh, to enhance the monitoring and supervision in relation to ensuring the water supply uh, security and safety. There are some regulations in terms of the licensing of the local government in water supply and drainage. There are regulations on uh, dealing with the violations in water supply. So here are the five different policy groups in uh, the future law on water and sanitation that we are developing. So in order to meet the requirements of the country and in order to um, share and learn from experiences of other countries uh, that go ahead of us, we have a, a uh, complete uh, our laws and regulations. Next slide. Take for example, we need to uh, develop, uh, should, should we develop separate law on water supply or a common law for both water supply and water drainage or sewage? And the scope and subject of the law, whether it include everything from basic investigation to planning, investment operation, uh, management of uh, services, or just a part of these topics. And secondly, we would like to learn from experience in mobilizing investment resources for water supply, drainage, sewage, and wastewater treatment. We are having difficulty in mobilizing investment because investment is usually large. There needs to be policy to focus resources. Number uh, three is uh, uh, we want to learn from experience uh, in managing developing large scale water supply, um, so we win, uh, give uh, support in terms of investment for the rural facilities. Nowadays, uh, the, uh, we have a too many decentralized system because of socialization process, because uh, economic conditions over the past time um, are not very favorable. So there is a fragmented investment from uh, companies. Now company have a better capacity for investment, but uh, mm, uh, there are barriers in terms of the legal system. And uh, because of the existing fragmented system, uh, they uh, cannot make new investments. So we want to learn uh, from other countries experience. Uh, we will have a concentrated facility in urban area, but in rural area, we may still have to maintain fragmented uh, decentralized uh, system. And the next uh, issue is uh, 
the international experience on clean water tariff, wastewater treatment tariff, ability to recover enough costs and re uh, uh, and uh, reinvestment. We also have the role of the government, and uh, we also have the uh, uh, fi the final issue that we want to propose is that we want to um, look at the uh, draft law of, on water supply and water drainage uh, and water sewage of uh, other country in English. Uh, if you have an English version of your law, uh, you can send it to us and then we can uh, talk about, uh, uh, we can learn uh, from your experience. So these are some of the basic uh, content. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, uh, Professor Vietan. Would you like to? Then, uh, come on. On this? Thank you, Robert. You have just listened to the presentation, which are short, concise, with useful information. And uh, before we have a Q and A session, we uh, would like to invite uh, the representative of VWSA um, and uh, ATI representative. Each of you will talk about. Uh, we'll talk in uh, two to three minutes, maybe to ask questions to the speakers of today's webinar and also to provide them with uh, more information and also to uh, make clear what we will need in the coming time so that we can have uh, the plan for collaboration. So first of all, I would like to invite Dr. Nguyễn Ngọc Diệp the president of Vietnam uh, Association. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, VWSA would like to thank IWA and the speakers for uh, participating in this uh, webinar with uh, high quality presentations in the context of Vietnam. The state is uh, trying to complete the policies and mechanisms, regulations, uh, especially in terms of urban uh, infrastructure with the urbanization rate of 1% per year. The number of people in urban areas uh, is increasing. The urbanization and industrialization uh, process in Vietnam is very strong. The need for <clears throat> uh, domestic use for service for industry is increasing, requiring the better system of wastewater collection and treatment. The legal documents of Vietnam on water supply and drainage are not uh, very much uh, equivalent to the actual needs. Previously, we only have a decrease of the government, and now we need to legalize this decrease into laws or into the codes to be approved by the National Assembly of Vietnam in 2025. MOC is a, a, a agency assigned to develop this law. And we also have a lot of difficulties and confusion because Developing a law in the context, as Mr. Duck have mentioned, we have a lot of overlapping uh, legal documents in other country. Uh, the uh, uh, water law is related to water resources, to the territory management. But in Vietnam, one ministry is in charge uh, uh, is in charge of water resources. One ministry is in charge of other water issues. This law is uh, about water supply and uh, sewage for urban and rural areas. We are col collaborating with different ministries to come up with the most suitable content in the current context, uh, because we have said that the laws and re regulations need to be in line with the reality. So through the presentation, uh, we would like to raise the following question. So in terms of experience of other countries, uh, whether or not you separate water supply into one law and uh, water sewage into another law, or you combine water supply and water sewage into one single law. That is the first question. The second question, whether the law mentioned the model, water business model, for example, because in Vietnam, there are two different viewpoints. 
So uh, in other country, whether the asset of the uh, water uh, supply belong to the state in Vietnam, we have a two parallel models. The first one is a, a state um, uh, established the one member liability limited company. And the second model is uh, the facility invested in by the private sector. Each model has its own pros and cons that need to be analyzed. So in the law, whether or not it touch upon the organizational model of the state-owned companies that run the water facilities. And the third question, water supply and sewage is a, a special issue. So whether or not uh, the water law, your water law mentioned the planning issue. In Vietnam, we have investment law, planning law, procurement law um, for different sectors of the economy. However, for water supply and sewage, it is difficult to uh, commonly uh, apply uh, this law. So should we have uh, the uh, planning document uh, or for or, um, uh, the water because water is a very special um, thing that it needs to be separated from other things. So I would like you to share your experience on that. I would like to thank the international expert for supporting uh, Vietnam to learn from uh, experiences from the world. Thank you, Dr. Nguyễn Ngọc Điệp. Dr. Nguyễn Ngọc Điệp have uh, already summarized the challenges, the requirements. And uh, also he delivered uh, a um, message and question uh, to IWA, who we want to collaborate in uh, the uh, coming time. And next, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Tạ Quang Vinh, director of the a, uh, IT, ATI, to uh, make some comments and uh, question. Mr. Vinh, representative of IWA, VWA, and WHO, um, ATI is very honored to participate in this uh, webinar with uh, international organization on behalf of the leaders of the ATI. I'd like to thank you very much. And as you all know, we um, have listened to um, different presentation. The ATI is assigned to develop the uh, water supply and sewage law and Mr. Duke have already made a presentation on the process of developing the law. We need to make clear a lot of points in this law. And we hope that the IWA and the international organization uh, can share with us your experience and it will continue to support us in the future so that we can complete our political tasks assigned by the government. We very much need the international experiences we have a degree uh, 80 and degree 117. But the sanctions under these two decrees are not very clear for the local level to implement. Sometimes uh, there are also loopholes in the law. For example, whether we provide law for consumption, uh, do we provide water for consumption or water for production, uh, whether we should treat them differently or whether or not we should use the word clean water or domestic water. So there are a lot of issues to be resolved. So whether or not we need to refer to the uh, water uh, supply law or water drainage law, or we combine into water supply and drainage law, whether or not um, it is related to the land price what a supply facility need to also to take into account the land price. So these things need to be concretized. What about the water tariff? Whether it need to be issued by the investor or by the people's committee. At the moment, uh, it is issued by the people's committee. 
whether or not we should uh, clarify it in the law and how. And whether or not we should use the environmental protection fee uh, to assist uh, water, wastewater treatment. So these are overlapping and concerning issues. What about equitization of water supply companies? So whether or not they follow the conditional business model and what about the organizational model of water drainage company or water supply company? Whether we need to ensure that uh, there is a one consistent organizational structure or we need just give them the discretion to decide. There are some other things, for example, safe sub, uh, water supply, uh, asset management, what to manage, how to manage, uh, so the government have ahead the uh, regulations. The uh, rural water supply is managed by one agency. Industrial water is managed by the MOC, for example. So these are many things in which we need international experiences. And VWA uh, would like to collaborate with IWA to learn from these experiences. So we also have a safety and security of water facilities, whether the sanctions need to be mentioned in the law and what is the uh, level of the sanction to be handled by the law. So it needs to the, in terms of the policy, um, how to manage water supply and uh, water sewage facility, financing state management issues. So through the presentation by uh, Mr. Duke, we still have a lot of issues. We still lack information, international experiences on this issue. We very much uh, need the uh, experience from Australian Water Association, AWA, uh, the, and IWA. We are willing to collaborate with the water associations of other countries at an international level. And we hope that it will continue to support uh, the, uh, our ATI uh, so that we have a, a better result in our work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ta Quang Vinh. We have uh, mentioned a series of issues to be discussed. So now we would like we, to invite uh, the speakers to uh, share the feedback to the question from Vietnam. Mr. Robert first. Okay, thank you, Professor Vietnam. I think that this was a very interesting um, addition to the presentation that uh, Mr. Duke gave from the colleagues in VWSA and ATI. Uh, basically, they almost set the agenda for a, a series of webinars that we'll have to do because there's a long list of issues that you would like to discuss in detail, obviously. Um, and I'm sure that in the region uh, where you are, there are other countries that will be able to share their experiences on any of these issues and guide you. I would like to first go back to what Tom Mollenkopf said at the very beginning, that any legislation should be simple and clear. And I think that um, by starting this law on drinking water supply and sewerage, um, that you have to keep in mind all the time. Um, you're not trying to aim for getting the perfect law by 2025, but it would be great if you would have a simple and clear framework for this law by 2025. Your work will never be finished because the law will always have to be modified, adapted. Uh, it will evolve, meeting new, new requirements, etc. So it is important that you have the basis um, which is simple and clear. And the other point I would like to bring in is what David Cunliffe said about flexibility. Um, there's no point in putting uh, these uh, standards and norms as a very uh, carved in stone issue into the laws so that you don't, that you have to comply with them. It's better to work with a, a guidelines approach uh, based on the law that gives you the flexibility to adapt um, and, you know, we all know that 
um, as the world is evolving and as climate change is becoming more and more important, adaptation is a critical um, is issue. Uh, so, so adapting the, the standards and norms to new situations is a very critical point as well. Now, we have uh, heard so many suggestions of what to discuss, and I've just made a list, but I would like to, first of all, introduce um, the other panelists that are there, which we haven't heard of yet, and also give them an opportunity to give their perspective. Um, we have uh, uh, Suraya Hussain uh, from the National Water Services Commission SPAN in uh, Malaysia, which is the Malaysian drinking water regulator. Um, and then we also have uh, Mr. Tontuan Gia, who is the, uh, the uh, 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 national uh, environmental health advisor in the WHO office in, uh, in Hanoi. So I would like to give them an opportunity to briefly, very briefly, um, give some of their immediate reactions and perspectives and, and share some of their relevant experiences uh, from their background. So Suraya, if you could please give us maximum three minutes of your time to tell us about your, your experience in Malaysia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Robert Boss. Um, okay, so uh, basically our, um, um, my name is Suraya, I'm from the National Water Services Commission. Uh, abbreviation is SPAN, yeah. Um, here we are the regulators for the water services industry. Um, the, the, the key issues that we have here is um, um, the, the main issue would be uh, different parties having uh, different uh, jurisdiction over various aspects of water. Uh, SPAN uh, regulates the water services industry. Water services here uh, refers to water supply services as well as sewerage services. Uh, we do not have jurisdiction over um, water resources. Water resources come under the jurisdiction of state government. Uh, SPAN is a federal agency. Um, and then we, we have a um, uh, department of irrigation and drainage uh, regulating drain, drainage aspect. And then uh, that this uh, department of environment uh, regulating uh, 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 environmental issues. And then um, um, we also have uh, other various other agencies regulating uh, uh, grey water and stuff like that. So you see, there are a lot of other parties regulating different aspects of this water. So uh, we do have issues uh, in, um, in 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 coordinating uh, actions, enforcement actions, compliance and stuff because of all these uh, parties having powers, having different powers. So there are. Uh, loopholes, lacunas in the law, and they are also overlapping in laws. Uh, you know, with, with, uh, the, there is uh, state versus federal powers. Um, of course, uh, um, we need to work closely with the state government because they have the power over uh, water resources. Uh, but um, uh, also, the conflicts often arise. Uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, particularly when there are issues of pollution and stuff like that and which affects water supply system. So um, uh, these are one of the key issues that we face here uh, in, in Malaysia. Other than that, uh, in terms of uh, sanitation or sewerage, yeah, um, we have um, uh, our, our coverage here is quite uh, big and they're quite uh, massive. I think about uh, 80, uh, 70%, 80% uh, or so are, are uh, provided with uh, sewerage services. Um, uh, we do have the old system still, uh, like septic tanks and stuff. And um, uh, some of the issues in sewerage uh, sector is that uh, the old uh, septic tanks tend to not be maintained uh, properly. Uh, and uh, causes uh, environmental issues. And so um, we, we have uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, challenges in dealing with uh, this and trying to get consumers to, um, to convert their septic tanks and, and, and have uh, to, to connect to a public system instead. 
So we're trying uh, to, uh, in, in places where there are public sewerage system available, we would want uh, uh, premises to be connected rather than uh, having their sewerage uh, tended to uh, by way of uh, septic tank. So um, it's a massive undertaking trying to get uh, uh, the public to change uh, their septic tank and revert to uh, convert to a uh, uh, public system instead. Um, and um, and also we 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 have recently introduced uh, a law on uh, uh, subsidiary legislation on um, dislodging of septic tanks. Uh, in 2021, uh, we uh, we uh, we gazetted this new law. Um, uh, where we require all premises with septic tanks to, to have the tanks uh, dislodge um, regularly. Uh, in, in urban areas, they have to uh, carry out dislodging in uh, every 24 months, and in uh, rural areas, every 36 months. Of course, this was not uh, met with uh, open arms by everybody, uh, particularly uh, in the rural areas, yeah, because uh, you know, dislodging uh, services tend to be costly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, so and, and requiring it uh, every three years uh, for rural areas can be seen as a little bit uh, um, harsh, but, yeah. you know, this is necessary uh, in, in order to uh, prevent uh, uh, environmental issues and whatnot. But, um, so, so Raya, can, can I just interrupt you there because we, we need to move on, but uh, right, there, right. there were two things that you mentioned which I would like you to quickly clarify. One is you mentioned this issue of different laws coming under mandates of different ministries and institutions and the issues of coordination, sometimes even conflict resolution that is needed, and the loopholes and the gaps that may be there because of laws under different ministries not overlapping or not being harmonized. Do you right. have, uh, and this came up in the in the presentation from Vietnam also as an issue, uh, do you have a, a mechanism to deal with these institutional arrangements or rather the lack of institutional arrangements? Is there a, an overarching body where all these institutions come together? Um, um, most of all, uh, these are all, uh, like uh, some of these agencies are under uh, the same ministry, like the uh, Department of Environment and uh, Department of Drainage and Irrigation, uh, uh -huh. is under the same ministry as uh, uh, as Department of uh, uh, as the uh, uh, what do you call Department of Water uh, for the, the uh, span is under the water sector uh, mm. ministry. So uh, we we can um, harmonize our laws uh, through the minist at the ministerial level. Because mm. um, you know it's the same ministry, so yeah. it can call interdepartmental meetings and, and uh, harmonize it. Uh, the difficulty usually uh, with the state government because they are different, federal government and state government. So that's okay. uh, the difficulty. Uh, but uh, even so, um, uh, uh, meetings uh, and uh, through meetings and discussions and consultations, uh, things are normally sorted out. Uh, okay. Issues are normally when there are pollution issues that causes a bit uh, of problem because you know nobody wants to be responsible for that. But uh, you know, uh, but other than that, um, yeah, it can be worked out. Okay, good. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nagia. Could I ask you also to give uh, no more than three minutes your your perspectives on this from the WHO office in Hanoi's uh, outlook on things? Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, good afternoon, all participants. Uh, on behalf of WHO in Vietnam, I welcome the idea, the initiatives, and cooperation between IWA and uh, VWSA for this uh, organizing this webinar. So, uh, as you know, that you know WHO in Vietnam has been supporting Vietnam to apply water safety plan for 16 years. Um, our final target is to institutional, in, institutionalize a water safety plan in Vietnam under the law. So it's a high, line, high time for Vietnam to develop the law on drinking water and also like sanitation. So in order to institutionalize water safety plan, in our opinion, 
it's necessary to clearly state regulation as mandatory for water supply, uh, for water safety to protect public health by uh, practicing risk management in the whole production of water. And also we should clearly stipulate the roles and, functional, uh, and functions of relevant ministries, uh, stakeholders, local governments, and water suppliers. And we should clearly stipulate mechanism for financing water safety plan, encouraging investment, and also like setting up appropriate water tariff. And in our process of the development of the law, we should clearly define regulation on audit auditing water safety plan as the tool to ensure sustainability of water safety plan. As we get the experience from Australia and, and uh, the Philippines, auditing and you know and uh, auditing and uh, surveillance of water quality is already clearly mentioned in the law and finally we need to stipulate uh, accredit accreditation of the water safety plan in the law if possible uh, regarding uh, sanitation safety plan who recommends that uh, sanitation safety plan to be uh, included in the law. And right now, Vietnam doesn't have uh, any guidelines, national guidelines on sanitation safety plan. So WHO is willing to, to work with ATI to develop these guidelines as a reference for the, the, national, for the national law, or law on drinking water and sanitation. And finally, we should, I would like to emphasize that Vietnam only can meet the SDG 6 if water safety plan and sanitation safety plan are included in the, in, into the law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Nguya. So now we have a, a full picture of what everybody has been trying to, to contribute to this discussion. Um, and we can maybe go to see some of the questions that were raised by our Vietnamese colleagues. And I think the question that it seems to be on top because it came out in the presentation, but also in the comments made by the PWSA and, and the ATI colleagues is, do we, do we require um, one single law dealing with drinking water supply and with sanitation or sewerage, if you want? And that's another issue that may be open for discussion. What is the right terminology? Are we talking only about sewerage, which seems to be an urban focus? Or are we talking about sanitation and include also the um, the rural areas? Um, and uh, or should we have two separate laws, one on drinking water supply and one on sanitation or sewerage? Um, I, I'm personally always of the opinion that the fact that we put water and sanitation together has been to the detriment of sanitation because there's always been more interest and investment in drinking water supply than there has been in sanitation services. Um, and of course, even in the human rights context, the, the first adoption in 2010 of the human rights was as a single entity, human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation. But in 2015, it was decided to separate those two and have a separate human right on drinking water and a separate human right on sanitation. So this is really an open question that I'd like to see some comments from the panelists, the speakers and the other panelists on this question of um, one or two laws. Who would raise his hand to, uh, to comment on that? Not many people. David, can I just push you and see what your, yeah, your hand is up also, so that's good. Please go ahead. Um, from our perspective, it's neater to have them separate. Um, so we have quite concise Safe Drinking Water Act and very specific um, sanitation wastewater guidelines. Um, they, we, they do involve some crossover in terms of who we regulate because our large wastewater treatment systems are operated by our drinking water providers, our water utilities, but 
uh, we also have quite separate um, providers, particularly the at the small end. So I mentioned that we cover all drinking water supplies, including water carters, uh, tourist facilities, uh, um, food production. Um, uh, so they can be quite unique. And at the wastewater side, but the, particularly on the on-site uh, side, that's a very specific industry. So for us, it's neater to have the Safe Drinking Water Act um, as a separate entity and the, uh, the wastewater and sanitation um, as, as a second entity. And with that, then with the wastewater, you can include both the urban and the rural, both the wastewater and the on-site in the in in that piece of legislation so that's that's how it works for us okay thanks uh, joselito in the philippines you have uh, this one act it's the code on sanitation and then it covers both water supply and sanitation uh, under one umbrella but still as you explained quite dealt with in practical terms quite separately how how do you see this question is it a real question that we should separate it or keep it together or is it is it uh, is it for the operational part not really relevant whether it's a separate or or single law uh, specific for drinking water and specific for sanitation uh -huh. okay yes because in the end of course it's all part of the water cycle and uh, and poor sanitation then results in pollution of source water for drinking water and then it goes into the cycle uh, from another angle so uh, there there is as david also said there's definitely of course a close linkage between the two but um uh, uh, suraya in malaysia do you have a legislation that is separate for drinking water supply and for sewerage and sanitation, or does it all come under one law? Uh, it's all under one law. We have this uh, water, water Services Industry Act, which uh, uh, caters to both uh, water supply as well as sewerage services. Um, uh, it's one, uh, one statute that uh, covers both, but under it, we have various subsidiary legislation uh, which caters specifically to water supply alone or to sewerage services alone. So uh, uh, while we have uh, this uh, parent act that covers both, but the subsidiary legislations are all separate. But uh, in, in our in the Malaysian experience, it works. It works, and um, uh, at the end of the day, of the of the day, it's it's all about water, whether clean water or uh, uh, drinking water. You know, it's all water. Uh, what what you drink comes out. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's all a, a part of the same cycle. So uh, it's best if, uh, in my opinion, it's best if you have one uh, single uh, 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 law on water supply and sewerage uh, as well. And would you then call it sewerage or would you call it sanitation? Because sewerage seems to exclude the rural sanitation We, we use the term water services. Ah, okay. So it, uh, water services comprise of water supply as well as sewerage services. Aha, uh -huh. and wastewater services or not? Or is yes. that famous? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, um, All right. thank you very much. Maybe to go to our Vietnamese colleagues, now that you've heard these reactions from the panel, are there any questions or issues that you would like to bring up in this discussion on, on uh, the structure of the law? Uh, uh, Chủ tịch uh, Hội uh, Cấp thoát nước Việt Nam ông Điệp uh, The uh, President of uh, uh, VWSA would like to raise some opinion. Thank you the international experts for sharing experiences. We are learning from you. For Vietnam, in the context of Vietnam, uh, water supply is invested by the state and water supply companies are operating efficiently. But for uh, sewage it is not yet paid due attention to now nowadays we can treat only 15 percent of wastewater so it is a, a area with insufficient and weak investment in vietnam malaysia idea is also very interesting we can put it in a law uh, but uh, the separate guidelines for each topic so it is uh, also uh, opportunity for water supply and water sewage to collaborate with each other to implement one law. 
So in uh, the next five years, if um, we implement the joint law uh, efficiently, and then we can separate it into two different laws later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we would like also to make, make clear. Yeah, Robert, give him one minute before he hand over to you. Is that okay, Robert? I, I don't think we should be closing yet. I mean, it's almost 12, but we can take two more minutes. We totally agree uh, with the speakers and experts. It depends on the context of each country. The ultimate goal is uh, the law uh, have to provide the best uh, water supply and sanitation services for the people to uh, protect the health of the people and then uh, protect the environment and then to improve uh, the quality of life. In US or in Japan, they have the water law since 1973 in Australia when we have a highly developed uh, system with the uh, nearly 100% wastewater collected. Uh, it um, may be easier to separate uh, water supply and water sewage. In the Philippines, there is just one law called sanitation law and the sanitation law also have a, a chapter on water supply in Vietnam, we agree with Mr. Diep uh, that uh, around 20 years ago, when we talk about uh, a separate water supply law, it is more suitable. But uh, now if we separate, it is too early compared to Australia. In Vietnam, we need to combine both supply and sewage, and then we can improve the uh, sewage uh, sanitation part uh, to um, be as good as the water supply to protect the health of the people. That's not to mention recycling of wastewater or uh, recovery of uh, natural resources. So uh, the law need to include both water supply and water uh, sewage. Otherwise, Vietnam will be slow in meeting the commitments under SDG 6. It's just my uh, additional comment. We still have a lot of questions to ask as Mr. Duke, Mr. Diep, Mr. Ving have listed. So on Vietnam side, we hope that this is just one of the activities that we can do jointly together. And we hope that together with the IWA, we can have more opportunities for more in-depth discussion. This webinar is a general one, but the later uh, uh, webinars can be more in-depth, touch on uh, different uh, specific topics like water supply, participation of the private sector, finance for the water sector, concentrated or uh, decentralized uh, water facilities. So this is going to be the separate topic for separate webinars later. Thank you, Professor Viet An. I think that, um, yes, it is time. I would still like to push you maybe five minutes more to just address one other issue that came out. But the, the one thing that came out of this last round was I think that in the development of these laws, um, it's always important to keep the water cycle as the central uh, concept. And that is, on the one hand, the small water cycle, the whole issue of drinking water and sanitation in the urban and rural settings. And then of course the big water cycle, um, which is the, all the water uses and the water resources uh, and the water uses for irrigation, et cetera, um, that, that needs to be harmonized with other legislation that exists in those areas. Now one a super fast round of questions to the panelists that are there, because we, we one key question that was also on the list was about investment planning and i would just like to quickly ask everybody in your legislation in malaysia in uh, australia and in the philippines is there any reference in that legislation to uh, investment planning or is that a totally separate area from the specific uh, water legislation that you have in your countries uh, nothing in uh, our legislation about investment planning we do have uh, going back to the point raised by Vietnam. We do have price control uh, mm -hmm. for, for drinking water. So we have economic regulation of our 
major uh, of our licensed drinking water provider. Um, so that's that's under a, a, a different department. And as a health department, we stay out of that. We're interested in the public health aspects of drinking water. We're interested in the public health aspects of wastewater. We let others um, uh, handle the economic side. They're the economists. Okay, that's clear. In in the Philippines? Uh, in the Philippines, there's, there's nothing about investment planning under the Code of Sanitation, but in terms of uh, the uh, the water code of the Philippines, in as much as it deals with the resource and economic regulation, I think uh, there's such uh, provisions um, in relation to investment planning as to the as part of the requirement to the water service providers. Okay, thank you very much. And and Suraya in in uh, Malaysia, anything on investment and planning for investment into the you know the the capex part of the whole story. Um, for water supply services, we have a uh, a, a government owned company. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Water Asset Management uh, Corporation, uh, which manages uh, uh, investments, uh, 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 water assets. I mean, I mean, they invest. They 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 invest in uh, building uh, water treatment plants, uh, and then uh, lease or, or transfer it to the uh, uh, to the care and operation of the water operators. So all the water assets ideally uh, shall be uh, vested with this company up to handle so that that is part of the uh, uh, government's uh, module on uh, investment planning for water supply services okay good thank you very much okay i think that we've come to the end of this webinar as professor vietan already said this is only the beginning because there are very many specific issues that we may go want to go in depth on um, but i want to just thank all of you the speakers and the panelists and the backup team who was behind uh, getting this uh, webinar off the ground um, in, in, uh, in making it a successful event, I think, and a very good start for ongoing discussions. Um, and um, I now would like to just draw your attention to some of the other upcoming IWA webinars that you want to maybe involved in, advanced control systems for nitrogen removal in full-scale water uh, facilities, Nitrogen is, a, is an important issue in many, and politically very sensitive in many parts of the world these days. So that's an important point. And embracing indigenous perspectives to achieve sustainable development goals is another webinar. First one is on 26 July, the other on 9 August. All the information is on the IWA website. Um, and then of course, again, draw attention to the Water and Development Congress and exhibition, which will be in Kigali, Rwanda in Central Africa. 10 to 14 December, where we'll have an international regulators forum that will address a number of uh, hot topics. Um, we'll also have a workshop on the links between regulation and the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation. Um, and I think that there will also be a meeting of the regulators network of WHO back to back with this conference. So with that information, I think, um, I would just like to say, please consider uh, connecting up to IWA if you aren't already and, uh, and become a member and, uh, and, and participate in not only these activities like we've just had, but also in the specialist groups of IWA, which deal with very specific issues. Um, I just went myself to the health related water microbiology uh, specialist group symposium in Darwin in Australia a month ago. And these are places where you meet your peers and your and your um, colleagues and where you get updated about the latest developments in your field. So with that, um, I would like to thank uh, all of you, including also my co-moderator, Professor Viet An. I don't know whether you have one final word to say, Professor Viet An, before we close up. Not really? Okay, all well. Then thank you all for your attention. Thank you all for your participation. I wish you a very good evening, afternoon, or rest of the day. All the best, and thanks a lot, and see you next time. Thank you.